This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. The subject tonight, as you probably realise, is home defence, which in our period, the late 18th century, was known more usually as internal defence. And internal defence is about the naval and military uh, preparations to withstand invasion. It's to defend the home country against a foreign invader. And what is today? It's the 14th of October, Hastings Day. And what is coming up on the 25th of October, Agincourt 600. And of course, in our period, the people that we're worried about are the French. So this is a very timely day today to be thinking of hostilities with the French. Unfortunately for us, not only the French, but the Spanish and the Dutch, because whenever the French came along in this period, usually the Spanish and the Dutch followed as well. So this country, Britain, was fighting on quite a few fronts and was fighting world wars. The world wars of the 20th century, although given the titles one and two, are of course more probably about four and five, because in the 18th century, all, all the wars, with apart from very few, in which Britain was engaged were world wars. This is a major, major event that we're looking at the defense of this country. Now, it's not civil defense. Unfortunately, some 18th century historians muddle internal defense, or home defense, with civil defense. Civil defense is a 20th century term. We all know Warden Hodges, the Home Guard, ARP, stirrup pumps. I mean, that is Hodges versus the Home Guard. Uh, It's stirrup pumps, fire watching, air raid precautions. It's not that. It's military and naval. It's armed defense. Now, in that period, and right through to the 20th century, because this is an island nation, defense was multi-layered. There was the principle, rather like a modern Bailey castle, which we're taught about as children, of having layered physical defense. The first line of defense for a naval nation like this one is the Royal Navy. The second line of defense is the regulars, the army, fighting on home soil. The third line of defense is the militia. Uh, That is a part-time body of civilians in peacetime, but when embodied, when called out, they are under military discipline and serve full-time as adjuncts to the army. So the militia become a third line of defense. Then what was very new for this period, we count the volunteers. And I'm going to be talking a lot tonight about the militia and the volunteers and what their characteristics were. And lastly, amongst the civilians in arms, as well as the militia and the volunteers, we have what were known as the sea fencibles. And that term has not continued into the 20th century and even into the 21st. The sea fencibles were only formed for part of our period. They began in 1798 and were disbanded in 1810. To give some idea of what I'm talking about with these civilians in arms um, is, if I give some modern parallels, the militia are very largely like the territorials or reservists of today, uh, wearing a red uniform in our time, in the 18th century. The volunteers wore an array of uniforms of their own devising, of every color of the rainbow except for Uh, except for purple, Mm -hmm. and including colours that aren't in the rainbow, like grey, gold, and silver. And they were formed of civilians uh, serving part-time, but under arms, and uh, not trained on the whole by the regulars or by the militia. The The sea fencibles were the equivalent largely of the home guard. Uh, sorry, the, the, the volunteers were the equivalent of the Home Guard, and in fact the Home Guard of 1940 first began as the LDVs. The sea fencibles are like the Home Guard, but as a coast guard, as watching the coast. And they're made up of seafarers, merchant navy, fishermen, rope, rope makers, sail makers, ship rides, ships carpenters, ferrymen, anyone who knew their patch of coast. So we're looking at tonight the militia, the volunteers, and the sea fencibles. So that's what home defense is. Now, as my opening words for the title of this talk, I had trust the people. And those of you who are eagle-eyed will know that I've rather lifted a later phrase. This is not a phrase from the 18th century. This is the mantra of the people's William, 
as William Ewart Gladstone, 1892 general election, he fought on the catchphrase, trust the people. But it is so apposite for our period that I've lifted it. He, of course, was as alleging that the Tories went from a fearful of popular democracy. I will be going into tonight uh, how it was that the establishment, the authorities, at a time of tremendous upheaval across the channel with the French Revolution, the execution of the monarch, and, and the guillotining of the nobility, just across the channel, with the treason trials of the 1790s in this country, the anti-treason, anti-sedition, putting down a protest, putting down a bread rioters, uh, trying to cope with civil unrest and rick burning, how did this country <coughs> so trust the people as to put a musket in the hands of the peasantry, of the working man, the common man? This was to become mass mobilization. That's what this talk is about, trust. Just a couple of other things. I used the term mob in the title. Now, mob came into this country in the 17th century as a mobile, the shifting, heaving mass of the population with varying allegiances, often associated with, with, with protests and rising up against the JPs or whoever was trying to put them down, largely um, often for economic reasons such as hunger. So I've used the term mob because it's the mob who were armed and by the government, by a grateful government. And that is the paradox of tonight. And lastly, why did I choose those dates 1779 to 1805? Very precise dates. They don't follow the dates of the beginning and ends of the wars of those periods. And that the period that we're talking about is the American War, the French Revolutionary War, and the Napoleonic War. I'm not following those days. The reason is the volunteers came along towards the end of 1779 and into 1780. So the volunteers first were introduced into this country in this period. And then they kept going, especially at times of panic over invasion, right through, um, right through to the Home Guard off and on. Uh, the ending period, 1805, is following Trafalgar there was a feeling that we weren't so much in danger from the French anymore. This was not entirely true because the French very quickly managed to rearm and get their navy together again. If they hadn't, we wouldn't have been building Martello Towers all the way along the coast, up the east coast, up to 1810. So it's not fair to say really that Nelson solved it all, but he certainly gave some respite. And that's why I've chosen, because the panic rather started to subside in 1805, I chose to end it there. So that's the framework for the, the terms of the motion tonight. It is an extraordinary subject. We have here, sitting right on my right, Katrina Novikas. And in her magnificent catalogue, while she was at the Bodleian Library in 2003, for the uh, bicentenary of the Great Panic of 1803, when we feared invasion and the this was the worst panic we've ever had um, until 1940. Uh, Katrina did, with two colleagues, this wonderful um, analysis of what was happening and beautifully illustrated. And her words rang in my mind then and since. For the first time, the generals trusted the masses to be armed and to fight as auxiliaries to the army. Now, that is something that Katrina wrote, and it is an extraordinary sentence. For the first time, the generals trusted the masses to be armed and to fight as auxiliaries to the army. If we read books by John Cookson, The British Armed Nation, he writes that this mass mobilization was the greatest popular movement of the Hanoverian age. When Linda Colley was doing Britons, she rightly takes the task E.P. Thompson, writing of the making of the English working class, for portraying the probably most prevalent form of um, common experience for the working man, being uh, uh, rising against oppression in various ways, um, factory life, the discipline of, of factory <coughs> life, the shedding of the old customs and freedoms of the countryside, though Thompson ignores the rural labourer who was hired by the year, which is a bigger mission. But actually, Thompson has nothing to say on what was, according to Collie, and I would agree with her, the greatest common shared experience of the working man, 
which was to be in, as a comrade in arms with his fellow workers. The numbers are extraordinary. At the height of the panic, so they did come in waves, including people in the Royal Navy and the, and the regulars, two in five of the population male of this country aged 17 to 55 was in arms. Two in five. If we discount the regulars and we discount the Royal Navy, that's a big lot to discount, one in five of the men aged 17 to 55 were in arms as part-timers. This is completely different from anything else, um, says Cookson. Um, it's a British phenomenon. On the continent, the numbers and in arms in France, Austria, and Russia in our period are one in 14. Remember I said one in, uh, one in four at the height, more usually one in five. One in 14 in France, Austria, Russia. Prussia, where you might think they would be approximating our numbers, one in 10. And of those Prussians, a lot of them are non-Prussians. They're not a national force. There was a huge amount of social cohesion in the way the British were approaching it. So, what is going on? How was it that the British trusted the people? I would say there are quite a lot of factors involved. First of all, the authorities, those in authorities, knew their people. They lived on their patch. They were not placemen in Whitehall. They were not hangers-on at court. I'm talking of the Lord Lieutenant, the Deputy Lieutenants, the JPs, the people who were charged with having to recruit and to, and to get the levies together. They lived amongst their people, they knew them, they trusted, they had a sense of what they were about. They knew that they were suffering at times, they knew there were bread riots in 1795, 1800 because of the, the terrible famines, they, 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 but they still said, although there's a jacobinical tinge to the people, although there's a, a democratical tinge to the people, they are loyal to the crown and we will trust them and we will arm them. The second thing in is it was done by volunteers. It wasn't done by coercion. Now, if you're not coercing people, you're more likely to have what I've just mentioned, the cohesion, the feeling that we're all in it together, the feeling that we're fighting against a common foe. Now, that feeling was particularly prevalent once Napoleon came along. <coughs> it was not so prevalent in the American War until there was a threat from the French, Spanish, and Dutch. And it was not so prevalent at all in the 1790s in the French Revolutionary War, which was very divisive politically in this country. And a lot of people who were prepared to fight and join the volunteers in the early 1780s, and after 1803, when the Napoleonic War broke out, were not in arms in the 1790s. That is a rather different period. There are so many facets to that, which I'd love to go into, which, which I can't. But I'm not trying to allege that there is a, a, a thread that is absolutely the same and at the same tenor all the way through this period. It comes in waves, it comes and goes, rises and falls. So that's the first, they, those are the first two things. The local leaders knew their people, lived on the patch, and it was voluntaristic, it was by consent. But this was a really cunning bit, the third element. It was in the people's interest to join the volunteers or the sea fencibles because if you joined, you were spared the militia ballot, which was a form of coercion on the poor and was very much hated. You were spared impressment into the Royal Navy. You were therefore protected from the press gang and you were not going to be called up under the quota acts and a whole series of quota acts in the 1790s. That's part of the divisions of the time. The quota acts were much feared and hated. So the militia ballot was much disliked, but if you were amongst the volunteers, and it could only, of course, be a sea fencible if you were on the coast. So what I say of the sea fencibles only applies to the coast. There were about 30,000 sea fencibles at the height, but 385,000 volunteers at the height. That's when the Royal Navy was 120,000, as against 385 and as against 30 for the sea fencibles, and when the regulars on home soil were about 90,000, it varied, and when the militia was 90. So Royal Navy, 120,000, regulars on home soil, 90,000, militia, 90, sea fencibles, 30,000, volunteers, 385,000. That's why we get this figure of one in four to one in five. It's the volunteers. 
this mass movement. So it was in the men's interest to join up. Obviously, it was only men. The volunteers were 17 to 55 in age. The militia age was 18 to 45. Then another element was that if you were in the volunteers, there was no military discipline. This is what they really feared, the brutal discipline of the militia and the army, that is the militia when embodied, and the army was much feared. There was no military discipline in the sea fencibles or in the volunteers. That was a great relief. You weren't scaring the men off. Interestingly, for the children of the poor in Sunday schools, there was no corporal punishment. And that's a rather interesting uh, parallel with the fact that there's no uh, uh, flogging and brutal discipline for the poor of the parish who are in the volunteers. A, a, a rather nice parallel. And lastly, it was fun. I, at the very end of my talk, you'll see a few slides which show it really was fun. You're in it, you're exercising in the evening with your mates from work, you're exercising on Sundays, and you're paid uh, with your mates from work, and you're doing fun things, petty fights, sham fights, one, the one half of you has to pretend to be the French, which is not so much fun. The other half of you are the British, and it's always the red British who win in the sham fights. Uh, you can see from diarists of the period that people rather enjoyed it and got caught up in the spirit of it. So let's start looking at a few slides. I mentioned that things changed when the Dutch joined in. And tonight, we're going to be looking particularly at East Anglia, the reason I want to do this is because when the Dutch came along in the wars, and that's from the end of 1780 in the First War, the American War, and the Austrian Netherlands from 1794 in the Second War, and the, um, and the United Provinces, what we know as Holland, who then became the Batavian Republic, 1795, that altered the threat greatly, because we're not just talking of a threat of invasion from France, we're talking of a threat of invasion from across the North Sea, the <coughs> Southern North Sea from Holland. And I'm looking tonight particularly at, at, at county level. Norfolk, for instance, for the people of Norfolk, Holland was nearer than London by 30 miles. And so for Holland to get engaged was a real threat because as we see here, you've got some Dutch ships here and they're just beached on the sands at Great Yarmouth. This is not the harbour at Yarmouth. This is just on an open beach. And much of the Norfolk coast, we all know that lovely rounded coastline that sticks out into the North Sea, it's open beach, a lot of it. The Dutch fishermen were used to coming in there, beaching their ships for water. They would do it on the half tide and then float off again on the next tide. They, therefore, knew how to approach the shore and land men in a way that Napoleon never did. And it was a particular danger for the British that the Dutch should be engaged because they knew every creek along the coast intimately, being superb sailors and navigators. So this is happier times when we are not at war. The Norfolk press would always regard a war with Holland as a civil war because the links were so close, architectural, emotional, religious. There was a great feeling of brotherhood with the Dutch, and to be at war with the Dutch was an enormous sorrow. And even the Battle of Camperdown, where Adam Duncan defeated the uh, valiant Dutch am admiral, was, re was recorded with more sorrow than with pride. Here we have the last weeks of peace before war broke out again after the Peace of Amiens. This is 1803, April, war broke out again in mid-May. Here's Boney taunting a very placid, solid John Bull. I'm not going to read out all the detailed stuff, but, but Napoleon is, in his seven league boots is taunting John Bull, who says, there's a few of my wooden walls in the offing shall give you a pretty peppering. And there, looking rather spindly to us, perhaps as the Royal Navy mass on the horizon, John Bull is satisfied that he will be protected because the wooden walls are there for him. Well, the poor wooden walls couldn't be everywhere, but it is likely that they could have dispelled a lot of Napoleon's shallow barges had they started to come across. But what a difference a few weeks make. Here's John Bull in uniform. Uh, the red coats on the right are all the... Uh, the men of Kent, the volunteers from Kent. Here's Boney in his colossal hat, a very spindly figure on the left, being treated to gunpowder soup, fireworks, custard, forcemeat balls, 
Kentish artichokes and all the bayonet, uh, bayonets there spiking in. And um, indeed, gentlemen, I beg to be excused. I don't at all like your entertainment. So suddenly, John Ball, this placid figure, is transformed into a volunteer who is going to be prepared to take on Napoleon. Uh, it's going to be quite a challenge. I said that I'll be looking at one county because, in my opinion, we can only look at how this was achieved and how the trusting of the people came about if we do it at local level. And unlike uh, most aspects of British life at the time, which were highly centralised, the, uh, the, the work of defence, of internal defence, was decentralised and complex, to use Paul Langford's terms. This is Raynham Hall in the very centre of Norfolk. It was the hub of anti-invasion planning, as all such buildings were being dotted around the country as the Lord Lieutenant's private house. Here's the Lord Lieutenant himself, in real life a field marshal in the British Army, a man who had served at Dettingen, at Culloden, which he hated and took against Butcher Cumberland thereafter. And he was an extraordinarily talented military man. He won Canada for the British because on Wolfe's death at Quebec, um, on, the, on the heights of Abraham, it was Townsend who took over. The first Marquis Townsend was a brilliant, imaginative man, and he was excellent at keeping the county together to withstand all the pressures that were on it. He was writing daily to, to London, and he was trying to keep everybody's morale up and everybody's nerve. And interestingly, he is not wearing the uniform, which he could have done for his portrait. He was either a general or a field marshal at the time. He's wearing the uniform of the Norfolk militia, of which he was more proud because it was he who had steered the Militia Bill through Parliament in 1757. It's through him that this country got the reconstituted, reconstituted militia, which had died out in the English Civil War. It was also he who founded the volunteer movement, although Norfolk was a very unmilitary county and not very um, anxious to take part at times, it was a Norfolk man who founded the volunteers just as the Dutch were entering the war and he founded the Norfolk Rangers and chose the uniform of the Rangers as green. But he's in the uniform of the Norfolk militia, and his descendant, the present Marquis Townsend, told me with a grin that he infuriated uh, Wolfe by, by persisting in not wearing a British Army uniform throughout the campaign. Here's the Marquis again, then a Viscount. Um, eh, at the time, the Militia Bill had just been going through Parliament and just before he set off in the Annus Mirabilis of 1759, 1759, he is reviewing the Western Battalion of the Norfolk Militia at King's Lynn. Now look at that, the thin red line with our bayonets fixed. That is not the way home defence was going to be organised. The militia, and I'm going to come on in the central part of my talk to what the militia was about, the volunteers and the sea fencibles, but just to summarise here, the militia were seen as an adjunct to the regulars. They were used to fighting in, with, with heavy, um, heavy uh, kit, their very heavy muskets in this line. They were very well drilled, very orderly, the sort of line that had held Culloden against what is, was held to be a more of a rabble army in the form of the Highlanders. The volunteers were entirely different. That's why the volunteers had green 80 years before um, green was adopted as khaki in the British Army. They didn't all have green, but a lot of them did. The volunteers were going to be into things like hedge fighting, sharpshooting, um, parrying the enemy, not trying to form a fixed line. Um, so the militia, as seen here, was part of the British Army in the sense of training. They would train alongside the regulars, but they had a different organisation and they were paid for out of the county rate. Very important point, they were not paid for nationally. It was the poor counties who had to um, find the money and the money shot up in that time. Um, in Norfolk, when the county rate in peacetime might be £400 a quarter, it was £1,800 a quarter that had to be found, in particular to support militiamen's families. The militia was an ex extremely expensive um, way of doing things because they were full-timers once embodied. And if they were full-timers, then the men's families, they might have eight or ten children, 
often became chargeable to the parish. It was a very, very difficult organisation to run. Now, I'm sorry to inflict this on you, but for us to understand this tonight, we do have to get to grips. Command and communication, and this holds good across the whole of England, at the height of the panics, 1798 to 1805. If you see a solid line, that's a line of command. If you see a dotted line, that's a line of communication. If people are in italic, that's because they are civilians and they are part-timers. So at the bottom, you'll see the sea festivals and the volunteers in italic. Let's start at the top. You have political control, which is always a good thing in a democracy. This is the cabinet. First Lord of the Admiralty controls the Navy in blue. Secretary for War controls the Army, and that's the Secretary for War, not the Secretary at War. And some historians do get muddled. The Secretary at War was a more junior position in charge of welfare and admin of the Army. This was like a Secretary of State for Defence, but with the Navy taken out and obviously no Air Force. And you have the Home Secretary. I've done them in different colours so that we can easily see how, they are, um, how they're doing their chain of command. This was really important for having an effective internal defence system. If you didn't have a good structure, nothing was going to come right. These men were astonishingly um, hard-working. They were, if you go to the public record office to the National Archives where all their uh, correspondence is on the whole, some are in county record offices, they are writing dozens and dozens of letters a day and it's not just writing, they're getting things done. So the first Lord of the Admiralty controls the Lords of the Admiralty, who control the commanders of the fleets who are going to be repelling the invader, North Sea Fleet, Channel Fleet. They're doing the blockades. The sea fencibles come not from the Royal Navy and, and, at sea, but they come from the Lords of the Admiralty, and they're properly paid too. The Secretary for War, you see a dual line of command there. Master General of the Ordnance um, uh, is in charge of the Royal Artillery and Royal Engineers. And, in, and the Secretary for War is in charge of the Commander-in-Chief, for most of our period, HRH, the Duke of York, uh, second son of George III. He's in charge of the cavalry and the infantry, and therefore not the artillery and engineers. Then you have between 11 and 13, depending on the time, military districts throughout the country, that is England and Wales. And for our purposes tonight, that's the Eastern Military District, which Katrina Navickas has done a lot of work on while at the Bodley Inn, and on the staff, artillery and engineers, and they were very, very active people, out and about, doing surveys, doing recce, doing rec rec reconnaissance, and reporting back to the man in charge, who was an extremely distinguished uh, field commander who um, secured Simon's Town for this country, among very, very many other things, as a naval base in South Africa, and later became Governor General of Canada. These are not fops, these are not lazy, laid-back people. They are active, the most favourite adjective of the time for the 18th century for a man who had to be in a leadership position, he should be active. These were all active people. Now, the commander of the military district was also in command of the embodied militia, that is, the militia <laughs> when called up. In peacetime, the militia is under training as part-time, and that is only if you're in, in, the, in the ranks. The officers and the NCOs are always um, serving. You wouldn't be able to have Jane Austen and uh, Sheridan and so on doing their plays and their novels if we didn't have the militia embodied from the point of view of the, of the officers. And the supplementary militia, also there was the Provisional Cavalry Army of Reserve. They, that comes under the, the part with militia and supplementary militia. So at time of war, the militia is under the commander-in-chief via the military district they're in. But you'll also see there's a chain of command from the Home Secretary, and this is the very astute part. The Home Secretary uh, goes down to the Lord Lieutenant of each county and his many deputy lieutenants within a county. Then they control the militia if it's in order to, to help the civil power to suppress riot, to suppress unrest to subdue civil commotion. And that's why there's a line of command there. So the militia are under, under a dual line of command. The Lord Lieutenant also commands the volunteers, but these were independent men. They were attorneys, they were professionals, they were schoolmasters, some of them were clergy at the beginning. 
Um, they were merchants, they were brewers, they were, they were all manner of people. They didn't take kindly always to the chains of command and some would write direct to the Home Secretary or even fire off letters everywhere and around Whitehall. Again, the correspondence is in the public record office, brilliant sources there. So, when I'm talking tonight about internal defence, everyone was extremely clear about their lines of control and command, but they were also massively in contact with one another and aware of what one another's problems were. So General Sir James Craig, in charge of the Eastern Military District, extremely aware of problems of East Coast surf, what the tides were, where the Royal Navy was. The artillery and the engineers were on his staff. Um, the militia were very, very aware of um, how far they could um, rely on, on the Channel Fleet or the North Sea Fleet. Um, everyone was aware of what the volunteers and the sea fencibles were up to because they had a very obvious part to play. They were at church parades, they were exercising in the evening, they were exercising on Sundays. Everything was done after hours because they were all working men. This is the last complex chart you're looking at tonight, but it's so important. And one of the people in the audience tonight is working on parish officers. She's working on the constables of Hertfordshire. And she was telling me before the talk that the constables had this major role, which they certainly did, in trying to get the militia together and, and, and organizing all the militia lists. The militia ballot was a really difficult thing. Um, here you've got the spider and the web. From the county point of view, the Lord Lieutenant at the center of the web, dominating everything. If you see the white block on top of another interlocking block, that's because there's command. If you see it interlocking with uh, where they're just interacting with one another, that's because they're in communication with one another. So the Lord Lieutenant is ordering the JPs. The JPs are ordering the quarter sessions, and both of them are ordering the parish officers, who are at full stretch trying to cope with all this. They're liaising with the clergy, but the parish superintendents can impose themselves on the parish clergy, and the bishop, who can't normally do such things because, of course, people have advowsons, they're independent of the bishop, they can only listen to his preaching, so to speak. In this, in this area, the Bishop of Norwich would determine what the Norfolk clergy were to do, whether they were to be in arms, in the volunteers, or as he preferred later on, this is the later Bishop of Canterbury, Archbishop of Canterbury, Manners Sutton, uh, he would say, I'd rather prefer you were parish superintendents. That's in a civilian role where you're ordering things like the evacuation in time of, of invasion, or you're seeing to the food supplies, or you're doing logistical things. The principal inhabitants are interlinked with the volunteers because they gave the local leadership. They set the tone. It's they who understand their men. They know that they can trust them. Um, and then on their own, and off to one side, the Royal Navy and the sea fencibles, and then I've already decided to discuss with you the command and control with the CNC, the regulars, and the militia and reserves, with the Master General right at the bottom with the artillery and engineers. It was a complex, um, it's called decentralized and complex, it's called fragmented, it's, it's called everything, but it seemed to work. Because if you read the correspondence, you see they actually got it together. The one person who was really worried though was the CNC. The Duke of York was um, not a very fortunate uh, battlefield commander because he had some very difficult um, logistical problems in, in the Low Countries and uh, things didn't go his way, but he was a very, very able military administrator and he was receiving 300 letters a day with a staff of only 35 on horse guards and he was managing to get through it and he was so clear in his instructions. He was hugely worried about whether this was going to work. And uh, uh, that, that comes out time and again, and the historians have written so much about what the Duke of York has said. So I've been mentioning these bodies so much, I really must just stop and, um, and just say a little bit more about each in turn. The militia, you, you serve in rotation. That is, the officers and the NCOs were there permanently. And they were, they, there was a very high property or wealth hurdle to become a senior officer in the militia. That's why the authorities felt that they could trust the people, partly, because the leaders of the militia and the volunteers had to uh, qualify by going over a property hurdle. Very high for the militia, less high for the volunteers. 
So let's say an ensign or a lieutenant in the volunteers might be a local tradesman, a wheelwright, uh, an innkeeper. But if you were re leading a battalion of a county um, uh, militia or uh, as they later became regiment of militia, you, you were almost certainly an ability or very upper gentry from the point of view of the wealth hurdle. The authorities therefore felt that the people who were the leaders had a stake in society. The trouble with the people, with the masses, is they don't have much of a stake in society. Uh, it is true that the open boroughs had a, a large franchise. Thinking of Norfolk, I would be saying Norwich, Great Yarmouth, and it was a large franchise, but often the working man did not have the vote. If you were an officer in the volunteers or in the uh, militia, it was felt that you would be leading a band of men and you would be, it would be in your interest to support the establishment. So that was one of the reasons why they felt they could trust the people. Um, the entry into the militia was by three ways. You could volunteer, and it would seem perhaps to be quite a good thing to do. You would travel. No militia ever served on its home soil, that is, its home county. The reason being that it was felt they would go native. If there was a time where they had to suppress the population that was rising, they were going to be on the side of the population. So if there were bread riots in Norfolk, it was put down by the Pembrokeshire militia. The Norfolk militia were sent to Ireland. Um, they, they were sent everywhere. They weren't sent overseas, other than across um, to Ireland, but they were elsewhere in the British Isles other than in their home county so that they wouldn't go native, and so it was less easy to desert as well. The militia wore the red uniforms that we've seen, and we had a really interesting talk by Matthew McCormack some time back about the militiaman and, and his material culture, his uniform and what he thought of himself, pride of himself. And there was a tremendous <coughs> emphasis, not just on the voluntary element, but on the local element. So you had a pride in being in the, let us say, Norfolk militia. You were with men who spoke with a Norfolk accent. Probably even your junior officers spoke with a Norfolk accent. You might be serving elsewhere in the country, but you were comrades in arms together. This tremendous emphasis on the unit at a lower level, the, 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 your patch. Um, the, 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 the first way was to volunteer. The second way of entering into the militia was the dreaded ballot. And that was a form of coercion. You had no control over whether you were going to be balloted unless you were excused service. And you could be excused service if you were an indentured apprentice, if you became a parish officer, and a parish constable, for instance, was not on the militia ballot list. Uh, if you were a schoolmaster, you could be excused. A clergyman was excused. An excise officer was excused. There were various p p people who were not on the militia ballot. But for the majority of the population, they were on. Now, if you were drawn, you became a principal, what's called a principal. But the principals, where they could, often didn't serve. They chose to pay to have a substitute. And overwhelmingly, the numbers in the militia were made up of substitutes. That is, hired men, where perhaps the poor drawn man had gone off to Norwich to find the out-of-work handloom weaver on his uppers and said, there'll be a bounty of 25 guineas, 27 pounds, 30 pounds, if you come and take my place. Now, as we're going to see in a later slide, they could join together, the, the working class, and, and form uh, insurance clubs uh, against this. So they paid their premium so that if they were drawn, there was enough money to buy a substitute. Or sometimes even they got their friends to get money together. But of course, if you were really poor, you weren't going to be able to buy a substitute. You would have to be a principal. But overwhelmingly, it was the substitutes who were in the militia. They were subject to military discipline once embodied. But normally, in peacetime, they were just training a few weeks a year, and, um, it, uh, and, and, and it was, they could almost combine it with working life. It didn't disrupt their working life too much. Of course, once you were embodied, you were totally out of your, out of your normal job, your day job, and you were then in, in, in the army. You were, you were in the militia, but you were in, you were in a full-time capacity. Now, the volunteers had a much wider age range, 17 to 55, they only came along, as I said, um, in, in the uh, 
uh, at the very beginning of our period, unlike the militia, 1757. And the volunteers um, were exceptionally grounded in their locality. They never wanted to serve outside their immediate patch. Now, each militia unit of volunteer in infantry or cavalry or sharpshooters or rifle corps could determine what their terms of service were, whether they would just fight, let us say, within North Walsham, the market town, and the environs to be three miles, or perhaps five miles, or whether that hundred, and the hundred was a very important unit when I was talking about the localism. People did feel knitted in with their hundred. That's the Saxon um, unit of administration where a lot of parishes, perhaps 11 to 15 to 18 parishes, might be in a hundred. They might serve within the hundred, but they wouldn't go further. Sometimes, if they were very generously spirited, they would say, well, we might go and guard the fort at Great Yarmouth to let the militia or the regulars have a bit of time off and go somewhere else. Uh, we might go and help out somewhere else that was important, but we're not, on the whole, going to stray from our patch. And this was valued because, had the invader stepped ashore, knowledge of the home patch would have been essential to harrying the invader until the regulars and the militia could come up with the field guns and the mobile art art artillery and hammer them. So in other words, the volunteers had to keep them off as long as possible. So that was a sensible arrangement in a way that they were not going to be called out of their home patch. Now, if you're not called out of your home patch, you can keep your day job going, on the whole, not always, but on the whole. So it worked both ways. That's how the people could be trusted, because it was in their interests to stay with their job, to stay part-time, to guard home and hearth. But it was in the authorities' interest to have people with local knowledge who could immediately sound the alarm. The sea fencibles, for instance, who were only in, in being 1798 to 1810, um, they would only guard the few stretches of coastline in their immediate area because that's the area they knew best. Their creeks, their tides, the way the fogs would come and when they would lift. They would know how they could flood the marshes if necessary to repel the invader, how to drain them if necessary to get um, some of the uh, field guns along. They knew their area and they were much respected for it by the people on the, on the regular, on, on the general staff, like Craig's men. Interestingly, the sea fencibles were trained by, the Royal, by, by Royal Naval officers, often of quite senior rank, including people who were soon to become admirals and people who were captains, and very famous names from our time like um, Host and Bentinck. They were training, when they were around at home, were training the sea fencibles in the evenings and on Sundays, and the men were getting paid a shilling a day if you were a sea fencible, two and six if you were a junior officer, like an NCO, in the, sorry, an NCO in the sea fencibles, a, a petty officer. Now, two and six a day was brilliant pay for a Sunday when a man might be getting a shilling a week as his day job. A, um, let's see, a shilling a day as his day job, yeah, seven bob a week for, for his day job. So two and six for, say, an innkeeper on a Sunday or a shilling a day was a very good um, addition to the family um, income. So it worked in both, both ways. They had people training them who were a very, very uh, good at their job indeed. Some of, their, some of Nelson's protégés were training the people on the East Coast. The muster lists were being kept. When I've been trying to search for um, details of shipwrecks along the East Coast, I can actually see how men were serving together in their sea fencible unit, and then they wouldn't turn up, and then they'd be uh, logged as not present for a couple of weeks, then later on drowned, and then we'd realize that ship had foundered. There are some wonderful records in the National Archives that are almost not touched. Historians have, on the whole, ignored the sea fencibles. Linda Colley doesn't mention them. John Cookson doesn't mention them. Um, Richard Glover, who did Britain at Bay, I'm pretty certain he doesn't mention them, because they're not where you normally look for in home defense records. When people are thinking of home defense, they go to the WO series and the HO series, what became later the uh, War Office and Home Office, but that wasn't, uh, it wasn't a War Office then, it was just horse guards. They go there for the county lieutenancy records, and they go to the county record office for the county lieutenancy records. But as you saw from my slides, the sea fencibles come <laughs> under the first laws of the Admiralty. When you're in the public record office, you go to the ADM uh, series. And that's where these wonderful muster rolls are with their rates of pay 
and whether the men have signed. Though we can't always work out from that that the men were literate or not, because if the officer in command, the, the captain training and was in a hurry, he just put a mark, an X, against each name. If another officer came along, he was a less impatient man, you'd find the men were signing carefully, because that officer didn't mind the fact that the men were taking a bit of time. He had 60 men under him, 80 men. It took a long time, if you're not familiar with writing, to write your name. If you're really in a hurry, you just put an X by each man. So we can't, as historians, use those records to work out literacy. But this is really, really interesting, and that hardly touched. So if any of you here have got uh, people coming up to be doctoral students who want a subject for the 18th century, try to, uh, pushing them towards the sea principles, and they've got access to Q, or county lieutenancy records by county, because it's usually not done by county, and it's only when you do it by county that you see how all these disparate elements come together and fuse to be a really good working force. Right, so that's the militia, that's the volunteers, that's the sea fencibles. Now, what about the common man? We can find out a bit about the common man from newspaper advertisements. We're going to see one in a moment. Because people deserted, people absconded. Therefore, advertisements went out because money was at stake. If someone had deserted from the militia, we'd get a description of them and what they were like. But I mentioned that the C and C, the Duke of York, had been exceedingly anxious about the quality of the volunteers wasn't uh, worried about the sea fencibles because they were properly, um, properly trained. The volunteers were not trained by the regulars or by the militia. They just did what they could and what they thought best. And uh, the Duke of York sent out in 1803 from the very recently formed King's German Legion a very good inspecting officer named Metzner, then Colonel Metzner, very shortly to be General Metzner. And the King's German Legion was a really good force from the point of view of home defence for this country. Metzner went round the 59 units of volunteer cavalry and infantry in Norfolk in November and December 1803. And what he says is fascinating <coughs> because he's looking at these lines of working men and deciding if they're going to be any good. He's a diplomatic man and he tries hard not to offend people. He was so diplomatic that the following year the job had to be done all over again and words were a bit harsher about the units. But let's just look at it in 1803 because that was the height of the panic. He's looking at the men and he tells us who they are. They're agricultural labourers, he says. Daily labourers. And then he gives adjectives to them. Attentive, alert, silent, march well, a stout body of men. Some are a little too short, uh, um, men but short. Um, and then, uh, he, then he says sometimes, disciplined, trumpeters and fifers, good. And then when there's cavalry, remember we're talking about peasantry, if we can use that term, we probably can't. Let's, let's talk about the working man or the agricultural labourer. A thousand armed cavalry of that class, they're just troopers, I'm not talking about the officer class and the NCOs, in the country, inspected by Metzner, and he said, a fine body of horsemen, charge boldly and well. And uh, there were in Norfolk at that time, seven and a half thousand infantry. Uh, that's including the officers, about nearly 6,000 privates. And on the whole, he was very, very complimentary about them. He was particularly pleased if he found they were being drilled by an old officer of the line, as he put it, or an old soldier. It was an absolutely palpable sense of relief in Metzner's reports if you found an old officer of the line, because that unit would then be very good. So we do actually get to meet what the men were like, and they passed the test. This is how people felt that they could have um, this, this confidence that they could trust the people. <coughs> This is from a militia manual of 1759 by William Wyndham, a Norfolk squire. He was the father of the man of the same name who was a major statesman of the late 18th century and the early 19th, also William Wyndham, Weathercock Wyndham. And while he was taking the Norfolk militia down to um, Hillsey Barracks outside Portsmouth in Hampshire, he wrote 49 pages of plates and text in a, in, a, in a militia drill manual when he was using the Prussian drill as his model. So if you were in the volunteers, 
and you didn't really have much of a clue about what to do about training your men, you did at least have the plan of discipline by William Wyndham to understand what drill was and how you do the present and how you should be doing the three uh, positions for the, for the fire so that at any rate you had a really rapid rate of fire. The emphasis in the, in the manual was on particularly rapid rate of fire. And then things like um, discipline and, and, um, and appearance, dress. Uh, a really, really useful work, beautifully illustrated. And George Townsend, later Marquis Townsend, wrote the foreword and was very heavily engaged with him because, of course, it was Townsend who had got the militia established <coughs> in this country. I mentioned that in some circumstances, even a poor man could hire a substitute if he joined a friendly society uh, called a militia society. Now, the defense of the country, here we have at the top our country's defense from a Norfolk newspaper, it was so prevalent that the printers devised a printer's ornament for anything military. So any matters military immediately signaled in the paper by this extremely elaborate um, uh, uh, picture of a militia man uh, under canvas and with his drum and his ensign and everything. Very, very impressive printer's ornament. The public are respectfully informed that a militia society is established at the Dove Tavern, St. Lawrence, Norwich. That's a parish in the centre of Norwich. This is in 1807 upon an equitable plan. Persons in Norwich and Norfolk desirous of insuring themselves are requested to apply to Mr. Freeman at the above tavern. Freeman will almost certainly be the innkeeper. So if you could spare a little bit from your weekly wage, you could enter this militia society to insure yourself from the ballot. So if you were balloted and called up, you, you, you could uh, get out of it. Now this poor chap didn't. He's fleeing from the militia. And look at the early date, 15th of April, 1780. The Dutch have not yet joined in the um, colonists' war, the American colonial war. Uh, they, the, it's just the French and the Spanish that we're having to resist. So I'll read it out because it's, it's telling us what a drawn man looks like. Ran away from Bayfield near Holt, that's in North Norfolk, where he was employed by the weak. So this is a weekly labourer. Robert Gibson, husbandman, that's another term for agricultural man, who was drawn to serve, so he was balloted, in the militia for Bayfield in Glanford in Holt 100. I said the 100 was the unit of administration. Bayfield and Glanford are tiny parishes in Holt 100. Is about 22 years of age, of a florid complexion, is very much pockmarked, so the poor chap has either suffered from smallpox or from the effects of variolation, the early form of smallpox inoculation, which leaves terrible uh, marks on your face. And that disorder still looks fresh in his face. Is stout limbed, about five foot eight or nine inches high. So he's my height, same height as the Duke of Wellington. Walks drooping, so he's a bit stooped. Wears his hair short and sometimes a small curl over the same, of a lightish color. Wears an old light colored cloth cloak bound at the neck without a collar. So that's a very distinctive form of dress. And a slop under it. A slop is a short smock. In the eastern counties, you, agricultural people didn't wear long smocks like they did in the west country, where you come down to your knees and often have beautiful smocking up here, beautiful sewing. They wore short down to the hips, um, like little tunics almost. A slop under it and a pair of leather breeches. Now, as with apprentices who've run away from their masters, they've only got one suit of clothes on. They don't have a change of clothing. It shows the poverty of the time. That's what he was wearing. That's what he'll still be in. There's no change of clothing. If they were lucky, they had a change of underwear. His friends live at Smallborough. That's his family. They live at Smallborough near North Walsham. That's a parish uh, between North Walsham and Stanham. He was lately a worker at Bodham. That south of Holt, quite a few miles south of Holt in North Norfolk, is now supposed to be in the neighbourhood of Aylsham. That's in northeast Norfolk. The mobility of these people is extremely apparent when you're reading about desertion or apprentices who have run away or um, men who have left their wives chargeable to the parish or if you're reading settlement examinations. The mobility of people, they didn't just stay in their home county, they would often go elsewhere and even within their home county they were on the move. This man is always on the move. He is a dangerous person for any farmer to have in his house, his honesty not being proof 
any person giving information of him so as he can be secured before the 24th of this month shall receive half a guinea for their trouble of us, Thomas Foster, and Theophilus Ives. Uh, they are parish officers for Bayfield and Glanford, and they're in trouble if they haven't got their quota for the militia sorted out. That's the urgency. So that shows the sort of man, when I'm saying trust the people, well here they're saying, well, you can't, you can't trust him, his honesty not being proof. They weren't all brilliant, and the people who were unwilling to be in the militia were certainly not brilliant. But I'd emphasised at the start that most of it was about not using coercion. Most of it was relying on voluntarism. Now this looks a very vainglorious type of chap, um, uh, only 27 years old and in command of a troop of volunteer cavalry at Great Yarmouth. But in a very short while, he was going to be collector of customs at Yarmouth, and he died as collector of customs Dublin. Uh, he actually was a very able commander, and when the inspecting officer came round, <coughs> he found that troop to be particularly good, with a really good drill, really good horses, a really good stout body of men, really well disciplined. So we can't judge by appearances. Their uniforms were rather astonishing, but um, that we, we have to allow them their, their indulgences. They were definitely trying hard to do right by their country. This is the diarist Mary Hardy, whom Penny Caulfield referred to. Uh, I've been studying her since 1988. Uh, she wrote a diary as long as the Old Testament of the Bible in terms of number of words, and that's a little bit of her diary. She describes all sorts of features to do with the militia and the volunteers. She doesn't mention the sea fencibles. And she shows us the more human side of it all. She shows us it really was quite a bit of fun. There was a shooting match at the local pub. Her husband and son were brewers, and they had masses of tied houses around Norfolk. And they'd had a shooting match at um, the local tied house, and the person who won it um, won a hat. But that shooting match would not have been for fun. It was in 1803, that would be because he was practicing for when he was in the volunteers. Um, she is writing there of the food riots of 1795, which took place right outside her house, and where the Inniskillen Dragoons and the Pembroke militia were called in to put them down, and also to put down rioters on Wells Quay at Wells next to, next to, next to sea. We are getting, not only from the newspapers, but from uh, the unofficial correspondence and from the diaries, so many human sides to a story which would also be written up well in the National Archives. So the Lord Lieutenant, his Deputy Lieutenants, the local Justice of the Peace, they all write up about the food riots that Mary Hardy writes of, but she says what her husband was doing in them. They had a very good time of it because the rioters all repaired to a pub um, six miles down the road, happened to be a tied house, and the beer delivery shot up from about three every um, six months to, um, I think it was something like 14 deliveries in a three-week period. So a brewer, a brewer did well out of um, insurrection and riot, so they weren't necessarily phased by it. This is her husband, the brewer. Now, he was an anti-war fox -like week, and he wouldn't have anything to do with the volunteers, never, of course, had anything to do with the militia. He was entirely clear of it all. It's, from his entries in his wife's diary, it's obvious that he was a supporter of Charles James Fox, of Richard Brinsley Sheridan, and of his local man, T.W. Cook, Cook of Hokum, Cook of Norfolk, uh, who were all anti-war in the French Revolutionary War. Matters changed in the Napoleonic War. The wars are all rather different. But even at the height of this nation's peril, when he was still of serving age, he never put himself forward. It's an example of a man who kept to his trade, and in many ways that was probably the best thing he could do, because it was the malt duty and the beer duty which largely paid for the Royal Navy at sea, the British Army in the field. He was doing his bit by churning out the beer and paying all that duty, rather than, um, than, than trying to, in a rather haphazard and half-hearted manner, joining up as a volunteer. It's an interesting example of how one could contribute. In some of the cartoons of the time that were in the Bosleyan catalogue about the nation of shopkeepers and the busy bees, they are saying that this nation <coughs> was doing well because of all the money that was coming into the coffers. I'm so sorry, this is not responding well. This is his son, who only joined up for two months as a volunteer at the height of the crisis, again a brewer. 
And in, for two of one of those months, he was in London getting hops for the brewery. A very, very half-hearted volunteer, he very quickly um, passed on his lieutenancy in the local volunteers to his architect of his brewery and, and later his house. It didn't work for the hardest. They were not a military family. They were not interested in what was, what was happening other than <coughs> noting some of the chatty bits. He managed to get his brewery clerk off being drawn for the militia ballot. William paid for a substitute, so he kept his brewery clerk. Though William did have to produce horses for the national effort. This is Weathercock William, the son of the man who devised the drill manual for the militia. He was a very active promoter, as well as being secretary at war. He later became secretary for war. He was MP for Norwich and then MP for various pocket boroughs. Uh, his great idea was that the volunteers should be in camouflage, they should be hedge fighters, they should be sharpshooters, they should be firing from behind every tree, they should be mobile, they shouldn't be weighed down by kit, and they should fight on their local soil. So it was he who was pressurizing government from an inside position. Uh, he, as I say, he was in a lot of the cabinets of the time uh, for how the volunteers could be uh, respected and understood and used to their best ability. So although it wasn't a military county, it did have people like this of influence who were pushing for, for how the volunteers could be best used. Here's a man who knew how to give his men a good time. Another brewer, but he was exceptionally active. He actually was in command of a company of volunteer infantry in Norwich, John Patterson, a um, very famous name, Stuart and Patterson, people might have drunk their beers of a certain age here. Um, a, a, a really active man, and uh, he had a huge brewery with a huge workforce, and it was largely his workforce which um, formed the volunteer infantry. And uh, he would organize sham fights, these petty, petty wars, which attracted up to 20,000 spectators. They were really quite something. On places like this, there's a huge amount of flat ground that goes off to the right by the River Yare. And tens of thousands of people would come on the heights here, and there was a pub nearby for the beer. And it was fought out here on Bramerton Common. He strapped a lot of wherries, that sailing barges, across the river, two deep, laid planking over them, got the opposing force, the French, who were another troop from Norwich, actually they were they were a troop of voluntary cavalry from Norwich, and they managed, the opposing force, the French in inverted commas, to seize a howitzer on the British side <coughs> on this common, and they would have this sham fight to everybody's enormous um, engagement and entertainment, and it was written up in great detail in the papers. They would have other fights at Great Yarmouth on the Deans or at Mousehold Heath at Norwich. It was made fun. So it was like with Dad's army, I suppose, in the Home Guard. You could see the frivolity of it at times. However serious, you can have a serious purpose, but make the means by which you are training fun. And that's what they managed to do. These are the creeks of which I spoke that the Dutch knew so well, hence the threat, that were the haunts of the sea fencibles. This is sea lavender in bloom in August and July in the creeks of, of, of the East Coast. It's just a sea of, of a haze of, of uh, mauve at that time. But when the mists and the fogs come down, it's very difficult to find your way around. And this was where the sea fencibles, that was their kingdom. And that's where the Royal Navy trained them. And that's where they would have been the first people to find the invading force. They would have had to do something to withstand the shock of the first um, in invading force before other people could come up from the military um, behind them. And this is a celebration here. England has preserved the world. May Europe appreciate her merits. The great Yarmouth celebrations of 1814. Yarmouth was a very loyal town, did well out of the war. So that has explained to you how it was. Sorry. It's not getting back in. That has explained to you how it was that this country came together to have this very disparate way of putting together internal defence, completely unlike the fiscal way, which is coercive and national and governmental. It was localised. <coughs> we don't know if it worked, because the Royal Navy 
were the force first line of defence and they saved the country. We never will know what would have happened. We can only speculate. But we do know that no one was reported in Norfolk as using his musket against anyone he shouldn't. A few people committed suicide, a few people were shot by accident. But nobody rose against those in authority. So the trust was vindicated. Thank you.